Um, can I introduce our next speaker, it was uh, Mr Gary Dawson from TELUS Australia. TELUS Group, as I was saying, is a French multinational group of companies that uh, designs, develops and manufactures equipment for the aerospace, defence, transportation, security sectors. It's a global technology leader with more than 81,000 employees in five continents. But an interesting fact, uh, TELUS Australia, which is a member of the TELUS Group, can trace its corporate history in Australia back to the 1890s. Uh, it's a company that is heavily invested in and fully engages with the defence community in forums across Australia. It is engaged in numerous defence programs from the development of multi-row protected vehicles such as Bush Master and its next generation or the successor Hawkeye uh, through to the development of a sovereign guided weapons capability and much more. As has already been mentioned uh, uh, by President and others that uh, TELUS Australia is the sponsor of today's event for which we are most grateful. And I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, Mr Gary Dawson, who's the Vice President of TELUS Australia, who in his career has operated at the highest levels across both the public and private sectors, including five years as a senior advisor to the former Prime Minister, John Howard. As Vice President of Strategy, Gary is well placed to present a perspective from industry as to how AUKUS is tracking in promoting the development of advanced military capabilities. So. Gary, please walk to the podium. Well, thanks very much for that warm introduction. Um, I saw Frank Woodley once at the Enmore Theatre and, and he came on stage and he said, on the count of three, everyone lower your expectations. <laughs> Still the best opening to a presentation I've ever seen. Anyway, it's great to be here. Um, I'm going to pick up the sovereignty baton from uh, uh, my, uh, my friend uh, Thomas here, who does great work, as does Rusi. I should say it's, 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 um, it's tremendous to be here and, and support Rusi because of the work you do. We, we uh, do a lot of work in Canberra as well with the, with the branch there. Um, and, uh, you know, we're proud to support Rusi and as, as we're proud to support the US Study Centre. Um, I think these are... Well, they're the most interesting and they're also the biggest debates of our time, really, and it's important to engage as widely as possible. Um, but, yeah, look, I, I, I do want to pick up the... Uh, it's a neat segue. I didn't have any idea what Thomas was going to say, but, but uh, he's, he's, he's uh, thrown me the ball on, on sovereignty and so it's a, it's a good way to start out because... Uh, Talos Australia effectively um, we're the stewards of a lot of that sovereign um, industrial capability that, that services the Australian Defence Force a lot of the core manufacturing capability that services the Australian Defence Force, so manufacturing everything from bombs and bullets literally to high explosives to vehicles to small arms to sonar sensors air traffic management systems and so on um, and we take that responsibility uh, very seriously. And so um, AUKUS and, and the implications of AUKUS for defence industry are really a core topic for us, as I'll, as I'll come to in a minute. I think it is also worth just spending a moment to think about the question Thomas posed around sovereignty, which takes me to what, what's the purpose of defence industry? What, why does Australia have a defence industry? What's the purpose of it? Fundamentally, it's about enabling independence of action by the defence force, by delivering capability, maintaining capability, adapting and, and upgrading capability. And in doing that, uh, industry enables independence of action. It's all about capability. It's not about jobs or industry policy or any of that. Uh, not that they're not important. They're very important. But fundamentally, it's about capability. And sovereign industry capabilities are those um, industry um, requirements that are needed to support defen the Defence Force's independence of action. Now... Uh, uh, the, the interesting thing about where we are today and AUKUS, of course, is there is inevitably a bit of a trade-off uh, between independence of action and accelerated access of advanced technology that will give the warfighter the edge. There is a trade-off there. And, and 
the mechanism that, that the previous government and this government uh, are following is, I think, to prioritise access to capability over everything else and attempt to achieve a level of sovereignty along the way. That's, that's the, as best I could uh, characterise it. Tom's talked about bounded sovereignty. It's a, a similar, similar concept. Um, the AUKUS work to date has been intense, but it has involved virtually no engagement with industry. Uh, it's been intense in terms of the, the high-level working groups operating across all three countries, uh, operating 24-7, as, as uh, Jonathan Mead, who heads the, the Nuclear Powered Submarine Task Force, pointed out at Estimates a couple of weeks ago, using the time zones to, to hand off to teams from Australia to UK, UK to US. Very intense activity. 343 people, he said, are on the Nuclear Powered Submarine Task Force alone. And then there are the six other advanced technology capabilities. There's been very little, uh, if any, engagement with industry to date. But interestingly, where there has been a lot of engagement is around what I'd term almost adjacent capabilities, which have really become the focus for the ADF in terms of urgent acquisition. So, for example, on the list of AUKUS capabilities, there's hypersonics and counter-hypersonics, which clearly is related to guided weapons and, and the aspiration to develop a sovereign guided weapons manufacturing capability. And that's a conversation that we are deeply involved in because we uh, operate the Commonwealth's um, munitions manufacturing. And if you can... If you can master the chemistry and, and the industrialisation of uh, making propellant and um, high explosives, you're well along the way to mastering uh, the, uh, the technical capability of, of uh, manufacturing rocket motors for guided weapons. And so those conversations are happening and, and they've been intense and um, we're heavily involved in them. Um, I say that's interesting because I want to read you a quote from the, um, the head of acquisition at the Pentagon, uh, um, a guy called Bill LaPlante, who was interviewed a couple of weeks ago, and he said, what really matters is production. We, he's talking about the US, we as a country did our best to not do production. We all accepted that just in time was the way to go. That's why we have a valley of death, because we didn't want to do production. Um, you say the same about Australia, really. Uh, for, de for decades, um, the policy orthodoxy was that as an open trading nation, we benefit most from plugging into global supply chains and just-in-time production. And that delivered in spades to the country and it delivered uh, the same thinking applied in defence procurement and it delivered for defence until it didn't. And it stopped delivering frankly, during COVID, when supply chains seized up, uh, transportation costs went up tenfold and so on. And, of course, the war in Ukraine has, has, um, has exacerbated that further. And it's driven a lot of thinking back to those fundamentals of we just need to produce more of whatever we can produce right now. And that, we're certainly getting that theme coming through at the moment from defence. In addition to that... Um, Thomas mentioned Richard Miles, and another quote that jumped out at me when he was in Washington was he, he talked about shifting from interoperability to interchangeability. And, uh, and <clears throat> the Minister for Defence Industry, Pat Conroe, was recently in DC. I was there at the same time, and he used the same terminology. So I figure this is not an accident. They're, 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 this is a, a deliberate um, uh, positioning. Um, and when you think about it, this has quite profound implications for, for defence industry and, and for defence. Um, it, it effectively creates, and, and AUKUS did this anyway, but it effectively um, goes a step further in creating a very strong uh, US orientation, I think, for all Australian defence procurement, in effect. It, it's, it's saying quite clearly that... Um, uh, the, the focus on access to advanced capability and quickly trumps everything else. And um, 
uh, in the words of a former uh, Indo-PACOM chief who was out here at a, uh, in Canberra a couple of weeks ago, leveraging commonality was the way he put it, leveraging commonality. And so this is, this is uh, uh, a very deliberate strategy um, to access capability quickly. So that's a very long introduction to say, what does that mean for a company like Talos Australia? Um, we operate a lot of core industrial capability for defence. It's coming back into vogue. I mean, for, for a long time, we've had to maintain that capability by selling into um, civil markets, selling explosives to the mining sector, for example, or selling rifles to sporting shooters. And that was the only way to maintain an advanced manufacturing capability. Now, of course, um, defence is signalling that they'll want everything we can produce and more. But what does, what does the broader debate mean for, for Talos Australia? So I just want to give some reflections around um, the approach we've taken. Um, first of all, the advanced capabilities. You've all seen them, the, uh, the six there on the left. So this is in addition to the nuclear-powered submarine. And um, uh, these are all... Um, uh, future focused I think is, uh, at, at the edge of technology um, and we've not been involved or we've not been um, allowed into the tent on any of those discussions so it's all being done defence to defence um, services to services on the right there is what we have been doing so it's interesting that um, five years ago we formed a effectively a Five Eyes group within TALUS, which was joining up TALUS Australia, TALUS UK, TALUS North America, US and Canada, looking at whether we could leverage the close relationships between the Five Eyes countries in terms of the capabilities we could offer. Um, that, of course, since AUKUS has morphed into an AUKUS grouping and we've created across the, those... Um, three entities, TALUS Australia, TALUS UK and TALUS North America, in total around you know, 15,000 employees across those, those three geographies, so very advanced um, uh, teams. We've created a series of, of work streams that pretty much mimic the, um, the AUKUS advanced capability. So even though we're not involved in, uh, been engaged, I guess we're anticipating that at some point we will be. I think given given the focus on um, accelerated capability and speed to capability, it's the only sensible thing to do. The other thing I'd say is that in the work that we started five years ago, it's actually, it actually proved very difficult to identify um, capabilities that where there was a multilateral... Um, relevance or um, a multilateral pitch, if you like, that benefited from um, all those countries being involved. So by that I mean there are plenty of bilateral um, examples. So Australia to the UK, Australia to the US and so forth. Lots of bilateral examples. There were a number of, if I can put it this way, multiple bilateral opportunities, but it was very hard to actually identify a capability where a, com a combined position from Australia, UK, USA um, made a difference to any of the uh, defence forces or defence procurement agencies. Now, this is a bit of an insight when you think about AUKUS. It's actually quite difficult to pull off multilateral collaborations. Um, when you're dealing with sensitive technology. Um, which brings me to my next point. So, and I'll, I'll try not to repeat um, the things that um, uh, Thomas said. But the point I wanted to make on this side is there's, there's two elements to understanding, I think, the challenges... Uh, to effective AUKUS collaboration from a defence industry viewpoint. The first one is around um, life cycle impacts. In other words, different points in the life cycle either lend themselves or don't lend themselves to collaboration. 
and in some ways they can be um, they can throw up such impediments it's not even worth trying uh, to collaborate. What do I mean by that? So if you think about um, if you think about that R and D, the early stage research and development, um, trilateral R and D programs. Um, would be very difficult unless conducted, we think, via an organisation like the DST group and their counterparts. And even then, um, the, the, the rules around IP sharing and so forth would, would mitigate against... Um, well, would, would raise the question, is that the most effective way to do it? Or would it be more effective just to um, tap into the US program? Um, so that's the first one. Industrial collaboration... Um, you know, on the on the joint strike fighter, there was there was a an extensive supply chain that involved Australia and, and the UK and different countries, but I'm not sure that's a popular example in the US. Um, it was probably right for the time, but um, the focus on shoring up supply chains, uh, I think, has raised questions about whether that model would would ever really be. Um, adopted again. Um, I would say though that on the on the guided weapons front there's going to be very close collaboration between Australia and the US and it might be one where the UK could be brought into that as well so it's possible. On acquisition um, the scale and budget that the US commands means that except for examples where it's the US pushing capabilities out to the two AUKUS partners, um, it's unlikely that there'd be a, a trilateral uh, angle there. And then support and sustainment. This is the one where I think, initially at least, there's the, there's the greatest likelihood of um, a trilateral approach working. And it's the one where I think Australia could um, most credibly claim leadership of that driven by geography, um, driven by uh, our ability to work with the US and, and, the, and the UK effectively, and, and driven by the very deep uh, skill sets in Australia uh, that we have around sustainment and support of, of platforms. So I think of all those life cycle points, it's an oversimplification, probably support and sustainment is the one from an industry point of view, that, that seems the most realistic in terms of delivering on, a, on a, an AUKUS approach. Then the, 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 the second point there is that you can't escape the fact that there are significant variations between the three AUKUS partners and that these impact on industry engagement. Um, and I've listed a, a, a number of the areas where a lack of alignment um, makes it very difficult to foresee effective um, industry collaboration across the three countries. Uh, strategic and operational requirements. Um, US and Australia, I think, are pretty much aligned around the Indo-Pacific. The UK, focused on Ukraine at the moment. Hard to see them uh, committing. I mean, they're... At, they're, of course, committed. They understand the importance of the Indo-Pacific and committed to it, but hard to see them committing in the same way that they're committing to supporting Ukraine. It's just a... Um, uh, you know, there are limited resources there. Secondly, budget capacity. I mean, the US uh, swamps everyone, right? And if you follow the old adage, follow the money, then the, uh, the US... Um, uh, control in terms of AUKUS will, will naturally follow. Um, and then, then you get into the interesting ones. Domestic defence industry policy. So all politics is local. Every country has its own domestic defence industry policies. Our, ours are being rewritten. It was an election commitment uh, by the Labor Party. Uh, and that will go to definitions of sovereignty and, and what it means for sovereign defence industries. Uh, the UK has a set of policies. Uh, the US, obviously, it's, very, it's a very sensitive topic. This is why Australian ministers are stressing that we're trying to supplement, not supplant, US jobs. Um, 
every member of Congress probably has a, has a defence establishment of some sort in their congressional district, and, and they fight for those jobs, and they fight for that presence. And uh, that, that can be enough to derail um, uh, high-level agreements. Um, so, so the idea of coming up with a work share that provides a win-win-win across Australia, US and the UK is very difficult, very, very difficult. Now, there's plenty of talk, you know, the, the, the language around the nuclear submarine has, has, has shifted towards the possibility of uh, that uh, three-way supply chain approach with Australia their initial, at least, manufacturing elements or components to go into submarines. So that, that might be a signal of uh, where that thinking is going. Um, familiarity with international co-developments. Um, I think the US has a little history of, of international co-developments. The, the, um, the, the, the experience of NTIB and the Defence Trade Treaty before that is that high-level agreements between countries are great, but they don't of themselves deliver outcomes. And, um, and they, they can be swamped by political considerations or, 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 um, or uh, export controls and so on. Sovereign IP sensitivities. Um, the, the head of the Defence Department, Greg Moriarty, um, at, at Estimates a couple of weeks ago, talked about this. Um, uh, sorry, it was Hugh Jeffrey. Um, talked about, in respect to AUKUS, uh, about the barriers uh, to progress, barriers that exist in areas where sovereign interests come into play, particularly around defence industry and where the defence industry is not solely the preserve of the government, but also significant private sector corporations that have their own intellectual property interests. So you've got this interplay of, of, uh, of uh, government-controlled intellectual property and company-controlled, and that adds additional complications. And then finally, export controls. Thomas has covered that. That's probably, in my mind, the biggest single uh, impediment, the biggest single barrier. And if that's not addressed, it's going to severely limit... Uh, what AUKUS can deliver for Australia because it will turn AUKUS into simply um, a push of US technology into Australia. Now that's fine, uh, that might, sorry, it's not fine from an Australian defence industry point of view, it might be fine from a capability standpoint for the defence force, but ultimately when you're balancing that, um, the, the, the goal of independence of action with access to advanced capabilities quickly, you don't want to lose sight of your ability to maintain independence of action, in my view, and I think that's, that's the watch out. If that can be addressed and we can plug in more readily into, into US uh, supply chains, that's, that's the sweet spot we need to be looking for. Certainly from Talos Australia's point of view, I can tell you we are entirely oriented now towards working with the big US companies. I mean, we can see this is where the Defence Force needs to go, wants to go, and so that's our focus. And so we're working very closely, for example, with Lockheed Martin and Raytheon and Northrop Grumman on developing a sovereign um, guided weapon manufacturing capability in Australia, where we bring to the table our, our capability in that core manufacturing, and they bring the IP uh, for the missiles. So I'm going to leave it there. I've, I've run a little over, but um, thanks again for the invitation to be here. It's a great topic, and um, great to see you all. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Gary. We just, uh, you scratch the surface, and you see so many, uh, so many issues that lay under that, each of them worthy of a probably seminar in themselves and working their way through, and I'm sure uh, uh, you and your colleagues are very much uh, engaged in that. The other thing that struck me was the... Um, uh, the consultation process yet again. I, I seem to recall just before the last election that the previous government uh, brought out a, a paper on August talking about the working groups being set up in these various areas and uh, it's obviously still a very closed closed area and, and, and at some stage they're going to have to engage with industry as you, as you alluded to.